certainly is a fine occasion for us to get together to commemorate something. And I think hearing the comments of the brothers and looking again at what was done and accomplished by our congregations brought back good feelings again in all of us. And then those who have joined us since then can probably even have greater appreciation for the establishment of this place of worship in our community. So it's appropriate on this occasion to discuss the spiritual aspect of these things. Uh, we certainly enjoyed reviewing what uh, physical labors uh, were put forth and what had been accomplished along that line, but there is a deep spiritual aspect to things and uh, thus the subject appreciating our responsibilities at Jehovah's Great House was selected for the occasion. Now, this idea of God having a house is viewed differently by different persons. For example, uh, some people find that concept, God having a house, very easy to accept. So if you say to them, does God have a house? They'll say, yes, he certainly does. And they'll refer to their church and say, that is God's house. Or they may refer to their synagogue or their temple or their mosque or some religious edifice and they'll say, certainly God does have a house. And they refer to some literal structure. Now, others have a problem with the concept of God having a house. They'll say, wait a minute, God's a spirit, isn't he? Yes. Well, they say, as a spirit, uh, God does not need a house. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's in everything. He doesn't need a house. So to even indicate God is having a house is something that they find difficult to accept as a concept. So now we have two different views, don't we? Some have no problem with it. They say, yes. This idea of God having a house is real, and they refer to what is literal, and then others have a problem with it because they say, no, it just doesn't make sense, not for God the Great Spirit. So when we have a dispute in ideas, we like to use God's word to reason it out. Let's take a few scriptures, first in Acts chapter 7, and this will take us step one in seeing really what is given us in God's word. So we'd like to invite each one to use his personal Bible, follow along the text, and let's see what reasoning we're given in Scripture. Now, Acts 7, let's start at verse 48. Now, notice what is stated there. Acts 7, 48, Nevertheless, the Most High does not well, in houses made with hands, just as the prophet says, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What sort of house will you build for me, Jehovah says? Or what is the place for my resting? My hand made all these things, did it not? Well, we can see his point. He quoted what Jehovah had said centuries earlier to the prophet Isaiah, and it said very clearly that the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hand. So that first group we talked about who said they did not have a problem with God having a house and referred to their church or their synagogue or their temple or their cathedral, they're wrong, aren't they? It says very clearly, God does not dwell in houses made with hands. So if we raise the question, does God have a house, and someone refers to something literal in structure, 
He said, no, it's not God's house. Because he reasons, he says, the heaven's my throne, the earth is like a footstool. What, what house could you build for me? Uh, what are you going to use to make this house uh, you're going to use gold, silver, or wood, some other precious stone. He said, I've done all these things. How can you take this and house me? So they're wrong. God's house is not a church. It's not a cathedral building. It's not a temple. It's not a mosque. It's not a kingdom hall. It's not Bethel or any of its complex. You can't build a house for God. He said it right there. Now, that raises the next part of our question then. Are we to conclude from this that God does not have a house? Now, the scriptures didn't say he didn't. He said, the most High said he does not dwell in houses made with hands. So we drew a no on that. But now, are we going to say categorically that God does not have a house? No, we're not going to say that. For several reasons. One, God is a person. Now, some have a little problem with that, but when we say God's a person, we're talking about a spirit person. A person is simply a being possessing or forming the subject of personality. Now, who can deny that God has a personality? So when we say God is a person, that, that's correct, a spirit person. He has a personality. A dog is not a person. A man is a person. Jehovah, the great personality, is in fact a person. So what does that tell us? It tells us he must have specific dwelling. Every intelligent person has location. So obviously God has location. Obviously then he dwells somewhere. So those who say God is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere at the same time, he's a part of everything and in everything, they're wrong. God is not everywhere. God is somewhere. There's a difference. And Jesus told us where. Now, remember he said, pray, our Father which are in heaven. That's where God is. So these people want to say, well, God's a part of everything and in everything. He's omnipresent everywhere at the same time. They're wrong, too. Now we got both arguments out. <laughs> but now when we say God is in heaven, let, let's be more specific. When we look up, we say that's the heaven. So are we saying God is in the sky? When we look up, we see the sun. And then beyond that, the stars. We have clouds in our immediate environment. All of this we classify as the heaven. So when we look up and say God is in heaven, do we mean he's in the sky? Is he among the planets, among the stars? Is he at the sun's location? No, God is not in the sky. He's not where the sun is. He's not where the stars are. He's not in our solar system. In fact, to reach where God is in heaven, you would have to travel past the sun, past all the planets, get out of our solar system, past all the stars, and go beyond to where the universe ends, if it so ends, and thus cross from that literal physical into another dimension, a spiritual dimension, then you would come to a spiritual heavens, and that's where God is. So when we say, our Father which art in heaven, we're talking of the spiritual heaven. We're talking of another dimension. And it's out there where God is in person. And that's why the prophet could say this. I'll quote him. He says, look from heaven 
and see out of your lofty abode of holiness and beauty. Isaiah 63, 15. So in other words, out there in the spiritual heavens, in another dimension, God has dwelling. Or as the prophet says, look from heaven and see out of your lofty abode. That's location. That is his dwelling. And the reason it becomes important for us is obvious because you must have some place to approach him. And that's why he takes specific location, residency, or dwelling. And out there in the spiritual heaven, it's big enough to contain him. Our earth, its atmosphere, our solar system, the universe cannot contain him. He's bigger than this. But out in this dimension of spiritual heavens, that's where God dwells as a spirit person. Now, that concept could get vague if Jehovah had not, through his word, taught us about his place of residency. And we're very thankful to him that we have his word. And in his word, he gives us enough in the way of illustrations, in the way of examples, to let us grasp this concept. Now, the reason it's not easy is because it's spiritual. So in order for us to understand spiritual things, they have to be compared to literal things that we know about. And when they are compared to what is literal, then we start to grasp it, we understand it, and thus we can appreciate it. Now, that's where God's word is so vital to us. Because he has in his word represented where he dwells in person under different symbols. Sometimes he calls his abode or place of dwelling a temple. Sometimes it's referred to as a palace. Sometimes it merely is referred to as a throne. Sometimes it's referred to as a tabernacle. In other words, things that we can in our mind see and grasp, and as these relate to him, then we're able to better understand them. So now let's take a couple of examples in Scripture how God illustrates his great house and pick up some of the terminology that can help us here. Turn to the book of Hebrews, please. We'd like chapter 8. And we'll read a few verses. See if you can pick out there from what we've given already how God illustrates or represents here his place of dwelling. Hebrews 8, verse 1. And then after we read it, we'll give someone a chance to a comment and show us how he represents his dwelling there. Hebrews 8, starting at verse 1, it says, Now, as to the things being discussed, this is the main point. We have such a high priest as this, and he has sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a public servant of the holy place and of the true tent, which Jehovah put up and not man. Now, I tried to help you with uh, <laughs> Uh, with emphasis. Now, someone point that out. Give us the main point. All right, Sister Gaskin, Maureen. Uh, we could refer to Jehovah's Je dwelling as the true tent, yes. which was done by Jehovah. Yes, and, and we like that she emphasized that because, you see, he said, with these, you can't build me a house. But it said his house. Now, notice that he put it up. Is there in black and white, which Jehovah put up and not man. So there he said it's a true tent. All right, now go over to chapter 9, hold to Hebrews, and let's just pick up another little symbol here that uh, will help us. Now, verse 11, Hebrews 9, 11. However, when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come to pass through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands. That is, notice that last part, 
not of this creation. Well, that's what we said already, didn't we? That you had to get out of this creation. You had to get out of his creation of the heavens and the earth, these physical things, and get beyond that, cross into another dimension, and as he says here, not of this creation. And there you find that greater and more perfect temple or tent. So Jehovah through his word then, and here's the main point that Paul wanted us to see, likens his house to things we know about. A house, a temple, a tent, a true tent, a greater, more perfect tent, a palace, a throne, all of these things represent well Jehovah's abode or place of dwelling. Now, To really make sure we got the point, here's what Jehovah has had done over the centuries. He has had preserved in his word five structures that all represented his place of dwelling out in the spiritual heaven. When you examine his word, he actually had uh, here, for the most part, five structures. And these five structures all represented his great spiritual house, his great spiritual temple, the one not of this creation, the one not made with hands, the one that Jehovah put up and not man. Now, just so we know what we're talking about, we're going to just bring up and mention briefly these five structures. And what I'd like us to have in mind is what I stated already, and we'll emphasize it as we go along, that all five of these structures represent only one thing, and that's Jehovah's great house, his great spiritual temple. And the reason he had these structures built here in the earth was to illustrate to us what it would mean to worship him at his house. Because remember, his whole idea in having us aware of it is we had to have somewhere to approach him in worship and to his service. So now I have given you an opportunity to think of these five structures. Now we'd like to name them. Uh, all five. Now, just to make it interesting, uh, we will name them in order of their appearance. Well, you know, this is not kindergarten. (laughs) You go to five Bible classes every week. So uh, we're going to start with the first one, and then we will come right down the line. All right, first one, let's start with hands in the air and see who is going to mention I love the reluctance because that means I want to be right. <laughs> All right, first one. All right, who like that? Now, Brother Jazz, you're so courageous. Now, what I like the rest to do, he's going to step out there, break the ice. Now, see if what he says is what you were thinking. Right or wrong, you're going to benefit. He just has greater courage <laughs> to say it. All right, first one. Let me just pave the way again. The first structure built that represented Jehovah's great spiritual house was, Brother Jazz, the tent of meeting. That's a correct answer. And more commonly, it was referred to, uh, Travis, give him a little more voice because he is on the right track. And more commonly, it was called what, Brother Jazz? Would you give him help? He started it off for you there. All right, get a little help right in back of you there. The tabernacle? The tabernacle. So if you said tabernacle, ten of meeting is correct. I'm glad he mentioned it because I was going to mention because it is called in Scripture ten of meeting. It's called Temple of Jehovah, same tabernacle. In fact... At 1 Samuel 124, it's called a house. Now, that tabernacle, of course, was built under the direction of Moses, and it had just two compartments. 
in it. It had a holy and it had a most holy. And it wasn't awfully big. The dimensions of it were 146 feet in length and 73 in width. Because, remember, it was a transportable house because they had to move it from place to place. But again, there had to be some place to approach Jehovah. And everything centered around this tabernacle. It wasn't anything cheap. By today's standards, it cost $13 million. That's right. And they were carrying that around in the wilderness and setting it up. It was portable. But that was the place that they were to use to approach Jehovah. So it was constructed first in the wilderness of Sinai, 1512 BCE. And it served as that place of worship and service centered around for some 486 years before it was replaced. That was the first one. All right, you've got one. Now let's go for the second structure built that on this earth represented this larger and greater house. Okay, we've got number one. Now let's take the second one. All right, Sister Jameson, would you tell us the second one? I think it was Solomon's temple. How many say she's right, Solomon's temple? Yes, she is right. You should have raised your hand. You would have got credit. She's asked. <laughs> yeah. You see, after uh, they uh, settled into the land, then there was a need for something more permanent. And that magnificent temple was built. Now, Koss, would you listen to this, please? That building, by today's standard, ran over $48 billion. Dollars, not million. Forty-eight billion dollars was what was put into and contributed to make that. Now they didn't use every penny to to make it. Uh, some was left over and they put it in the treasury. But that's the kind of money that was appreciatively put out. They built it fast for it to be so magnificent. Seven and a half years. That was quick bill for that time. <laughs> And 180,000 men worked on it to put it up in the seven and a half years. And, of course, it then, there in the city of Jerusalem, served as the place of worship so that there would be activity and worship and a location by which the people could approach Jehovah and carry out the service that he required and thus please him. Now, we all know what happened. When they went astray, it was finally destroyed when the Babylonians came in there. And in 607 BCE, what a sad time. It was destroyed. And the whole city of Jerusalem was razed to the ground. And that brought to an end that glorious and magnificent temple. But that was the second structure that represented Jehovah's great spiritual temple or house. All right, the third one, it's getting easier, isn't it? <laughs> Brother Elwell here, the third structure. The temple rebuilt by Nehemiah. I like rebuilt. Uh, I would like someone's name in there that is more commonly used, Brother Crook, in reference to this rebuilt temple. Zerubbabel? Yes, we have to say Zerubbabel's temple sometime. Nehemiah was instrumental in getting it finished. But now, here's what we want to point out about that, and there's a lesson for us in that. It was not as glorious or magnificent as Solomon's temple. That was the greatest ever. But it took them 22 years to build it because there was a problem. The problem was spiritual. When they went back to the land, instead of everybody devoting all their strength and energy to put in place first the rebuilt temple to worship and serve Jehovah, everybody got interested in their own house. They want to panel them and make them fine and decorate them so they could be living fine. And they got intimidated by some of the enemies around them. And so they would slack off and they wouldn't work at this temple. And then finally Jehovah had to raise up strong Elders, prophets, Haggai, and uh, they would go and talk to the people. Then Zechariah would talk to the people and pronounce judgments. 
And then finally they would go back to it and they finished, but it took 22 years. Sort of sad, wasn't it? That so little appreciation was shown for the worship of God before they got his house in order, a place for his worship and service. Nevertheless, that was the third structure. Four. Somebody hurry up and get everybody off the spot. The fourth one, let's get Brother Kitchen right here on the front row. Give us the fourth one. See if you're right. Take a guess at King Herod's temple. All right, Herod's temple. Now, it got Herod's name. Let's just clarify it a little. You have the right name, Herod's temple. It really wasn't anything new. It was actually a renovation and expansion. Because the one that uh, had been rebuilt at the time of Zerubbabel had started to deteriorate. And uh, uh, Herod, though not fully trusted uh, by the Jews, took the lead uh, in doing it. And probably the most outstanding thing he did when he enlarged it and renovated it and made it new was he expanded and put a courtyard that had never existed in the other three structures, and he put a courtyard of the Gentiles, which in the city of Jerusalem became like a thoroughfare so that you could uh, come and enter one of the temple gates and you could go in there instead of having to walk all the way around for one particular entrance. So it was like a thoroughfare, and yet it admitted non-Jews, Gentiles, into the temple area for certain uh, activities or for thoroughfare going on to another direction. We know what finally happened to that. 70 CE, because of their rejection of Jesus when he came as the Messiah, Jehovah used as an instrument, let the Romans come in and once again it was destroyed, burned, leveled, the temple and the city, and the Jews were taken away and enslaved as captives. And that brought to an end that fourth structure, which represented the features of worship in Jehovah's great house. So we have four. We have one more left. You're really doing very, very good. But you have one more that you've got to put in here. One more. All right, who's got that one more? Go ahead, take time to think. It's on. <laughs> Sister Rhodes has her hand up. It's a spiritual temple that Christ Jesus built with his lifeblood. No, here's why. It's good it came out because over half of you were thinking that. Remember, we said we were speaking about structures that represented this great spiritual house. So we have to have in place some structure that represents this great spiritual house. Like you have the tabernacle, and then you have Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, Herod's temple. So you had a structure that could be used as a place of approach for the worship and service to God. So we say no to that. All right, Brother Brown, Rome Brown. Would you be talking about our kingdom hall? Sure wouldn't. <laughs> Not our kingdom hall. Now, I should give a little clue. It's not fair if I don't, because maybe the way I emphasize something is putting us on a track that uh, won't lead to where we want to go. Okay, here's the, here's the clue. This fifth structure, and it is structure, in fact, was never actually built. But the plans for it are laid out in detail in the Bible. Okay, look at their hands all over. <laughs> Sister Brenda Brown, very good. Okay. 
The Christian congregations? No. Four. Go in that other room, uh, please. I see one hand. I can't tell, but they seem so eager. I think they got it. Is it the one that John saw in Fiction, New Revelation? No. <laughs> because when he saw the city, remember, he didn't really see a temple. He said Jehovah himself had become it in the reality. So these are good. We're getting these in because we're eliminating all the wrong things that you were thinking, right? All right, there's another hand in there, uh, Timothy, uh, on the front row. I can't see the face so good. That protects you. <laughs> government body. The government body? No. See, friends, please follow me. And, and, and I use this word by design. Structure. And the clue was... The detailed plans for it are in the book you're holding in front of you now. Detailed plans. It just was never built. Sister Stessons. Is it the new system? Uh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> Right here in the doorway with a swan. Is it the earth? <laughs> no, it's not there. It's in chapters 40 to 48. Now, if that that's the best I'm going to do. I'm not going to give the name of the book because I give it, if I give the name of the book, that's going to tell you what that temple was called. But I'll tell you chapters 40 to 48. Now, if that doesn't do it, we need to shut it down for the evening. Ann Conyers got it right here. I said a temple of Jehovah. It's, it's all Jehovah's temple. We, we're talking Jehovah's house, his great spirit. All right, now, if you know you got it, you've heard all the things that aren't it, but you know now you, you got it, put your hand up. I, I only want the right answer next. All right, Brother Garns. Ezekiel's temple? Yes, Ezekiel's visionary temple. Remember we said it was never built. And when you look in Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48, you read the details of all of this structure. And you remember after, just a little background, after Solomon's temple was destroyed, everybody was so unhappy and lamenting, crying over the city and temple destroyed. So to encourage them, in 593 BCE, Ezekiel was shown this visionary temple. And given all the details of it. But that's not the one they built. And you know one reason why we're interested in that one? Because that confirms to us, follow carefully, that when Jehovah destroys this system of things, and in that great tribulation brings in Armageddon, that visionary temple assures us that this great spiritual house will be preserved through that period of time. Because all of the spiritual aspects discussed in detail in those chapters have reference to how we operate and worship and serve Jehovah in the new world. And that's why we're interested in that fifth structure. Now, there we have all five. Someone raise their hand, give us all five. Now put them in the correct order. See, I let you skip over one and put it out of order just so as not to throw you off. Five in order. Brother Munjan, you got it. Give them in their order of appearing in Scripture. Uh, the Tabernacle, Solomon's Temple, Zerubbabel's Temple, Herod's, Herod's Temple, and Ezekiel's Visionary Temple. Okay, he got them all. But now correct the order. Did anyone pick up the subtlety of my question? Yes, Brother Kitchen did. 
He'll correct the order. I'll give him a voice right here. We have the tabernacle, uh, Solomon's temple, and I think Ezekiel's temple was seen before all the rest of them followed. Didn't we say 593 BCE? And it was given after Solomon's temple was destroyed to give them hope and encouragement. Though it was never built, it comes in that order. Finish, please. <laughs> Zerubbabel's temple, then we have King Herod's temple. All right. Thank you. Now, brothers, let's go back to the point we made. All five of these structures, four of which were built, one of which we have the detailed plans before us, represented one thing. They didn't represent four things. They didn't represent five things. They all represented just one thing. And that was Jehovah's great spiritual house. Remember the one not of this creation? The one that Jehovah put up and not man? The one that is big enough to house Jehovah and give him dwelling? Well, that is the one we're interested in. Well, now we've established then very, very clearly that uh, Jehovah has, in fact, a spiritual house, a great house that he has dwelling and when these literal structures were put up, and this is the point we want to make for ourselves, those worshipers who went there appreciated that they had a way to approach Jehovah. And when the tabernacle was there or the literal structures in Jerusalem, those who appreciated true worship, they wanted to be a part of it. Because they knew that that literal house was their connection for approach to God by means of worship. Uh, for example, now go to Psalm 84. And the psalmist here uh, shows appreciation for the two important things it offered there. And that was opportunity for fellowship with others who worship God as well as direct worship to Jehovah God. Now, Psalm 84, start right there at the beginning. Now, notice how he puts it, and it's good for us to think about our own appreciation here. He says, how lovely your grand tabernacle is, O Jehovah of armies. My soul has yearned and also pined away for the courtyards of Jehovah. My own heart and my very flesh cry out joyfully to the living God, even the bird itself has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she has put her young ones. Your grand altar, O Jehovah of armies, my king and my God, happy are those dwelling in your house. They still keep on praising you. So notice the appreciation there. In verse 1, he said, as we were singing earlier, he says, how lovely. Your grand tabernacle, your temple, your house. Why? What made it lovely, what made it beautiful is that you went there to worship God. And you met fellow worshipers. And those ancient Israelites appreciated that. That's why you notice there in verse 2, the psalmist says that his soul yearned. And then he said also pined. In other words, he just had this craving, this longing to be there. Well, now keep this in mind. The non-priestly Israelites who had the uh, privilege uh, to go there and do the work in carrying out true worship at God's house only had the privilege to do that once every six months. The rest of the time they were living at their home with their family, but those uh, Levites, non-priestly Levites, one time every six months, they could go to that temple and have a full week. And that's what he's saying. I just long to be there. While he's at home and not there, he says, I just yearn to be there. I'm waiting for that week so I can get in Jehovah's house, Jehovah's temple, and carry out the duties, assigned duties. They work to help the priests in carrying out the true worship and offering the sacrifices and doing all the things from the cleaning and the 
getting the wood in and the fires and all of that. But he said, I just yearn for that. I pine away. In fact, did you notice in verse 3 that he got jealous of a bird? He said, even the bird has found itself a house. He said, the swallow a nest for herself. In other words, he's saying, I wish I was that bird, because that bird could find a little part on the house of Jehovah, on its walls, and make him a nest. And the bird could be there day and night. And he said, I have to go home. And so I just yearn and pine away to be there. But I can only have one week every six months. What appreciation. So he says there in verse 4, happy. And that's the spirit. He says, happy are those, and I like the terminology, look at it, dwelling in your house. Now, we want to emphasize something here that's going to be important just a little later on when we introduce the point. Dwelling, I, I want you to look at that. Happy are those dwelling in your house. Now that comes in the background that we mentioned that those non-priestly Levites, they could only dwell in Jehovah's house one time for a week every six months. Then they went home to their families and their ordinary things in life. But they could dwell there and you were happy there because there they participated in the direct service to God. See, they were his servants all the time. But when they got there, they got involved directly, hands-on, worship and service to God. So that enhanced their happiness in temple service. What a good example of appreciation. That was all back then. Now let's come up to date. We've talked about the literal structures for which we're built, one we have the detailed plans of, all of that's in the past, that's all history. The big question that faces us now then is, where is Jehovah's house today? You see, all of that's been destroyed at Jerusalem. They have a little bit of the wall left, and uh, Jews go over there and cry and write out little prayers and stick it in the wall, ask God, but it's all in vain. He is no longer represented there. That is not the true tent, the ruins that remain in that city of the walls where the temple used to sit. So the question for all of us today then is, where is Jehovah's house today? Where is the true tent? Where is the great spiritual temple? Where is the place of approach today? Where is that house not of this creation, not made with hands? Where is Jehovah's great house today? Now, you may think that brother is very redundant. He said the same thing five times. Well, that was to give you time to think of your answer. Now I'm going to give you that question. Where is Jehovah's great spiritual house and temple today? I said so many times. All right, come right on down. So many times. And now let's take a visitor and uh, hear a comment from it. Uh, I'm, I think that would be the um, part of the anointed class. I think what I'll do here, I'll make all the answers right, and then you won't be reluctant. The anointed class are seriously involved in a significant way. Next, Brother Thompson Sr. That's a, a spiritual house in, in the heavens. I want to focus on him again. Travis, give him a voice. All right, let me ask the question. Now, so everybody will listen to the answer. Where, Brother Thompson, is Jehovah's great house today? What did you say? In the heavens. 
I like that answer. It is correct. Jehovah's Great Spiritual House does, in fact, have a heavenly realm. It obviously has a heavenly realm because, now notice what we said, it had to be a house big enough to contain Jehovah. It had to be very closely. It says, for Christ entered not into a holy place made with hands, which is a copy of the reality, but into heaven itself now to appear before the, notice, person of God for us. So there's the answer, isn't it? That when Jesus Christ finished his earthly course, his father resurrected him, it says he entered into the holy place, not that one that was soon to be destroyed in the city of Jerusalem at the temple there, but it said, no, he entered into heaven itself. Not as to a representation, but he went right to the real thing because in place, Jehovah's great spiritual house had been put at the time of Jesus' baptism. So when Jesus was put to death and resurrected by his father, then he went into heaven and into the uh, most holy part of that great spiritual house, which Represented heavens, the spiritual heavens. And right there, who did he find? He found the person of God in his great spiritual house. So, Brother Thompson, you are correct. When you answered, where is Jehovah's great spiritual house today? It does, in fact, have a heavenly realm. However, <laughs> this great spiritual house is, in fact, a superstructure. And while that heavenly part that houses Jehovah himself was represented by the most holy part of the structures built, that great spiritual house begins out in the spiritual heavens where God is in person and it's big enough to contain him. But as a great superstructure, it descends and comes all the way down, 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 right here to this earth. And significantly, all of the other compartments and courtyards in those five literal structures, with the exception of the most holy that represented heaven, all the other compartments and courtyards are here in the earth. So, while God's great spiritual house has a heavenly realm, it is a great superstructure that descends to this earth and it also, in fact, has an earthly realm. And in its earthly realm, Jehovah has today brought a people from all around the earth and he's put them in the house where he dwells in person and not just in spirit. Now, I'd like us to digest that a few moments because you have to see in this if you are to appreciate Jehovah's great house in your role, then you have to see that where you are in his worship and service as a dedicated person, you are in Jehovah's house, in its earthly realm. And by being in his house, he has brought then his people 
into his house, not simply a house where he lends his spirit to it, but a house in which he is in person in its heavenly realm. He's linked in its earthly realm so that it's all just one great spiritual house. And think about it, you are in it. Little, old, insignificant you are in God's house where God dwells in person that he would think so much of you as to tie you in to his great lofty abode and let you come into the house where he dwells in person, his own residence, his own palace, the place of his own throne, his own tabernacle, his own temple, and he saw something in you and directed you to this great spiritual house, that is significant. Because that means you have been brought into a very holy place. in that God has brought you into his own house. Now, this was, follow this closely, significantly prophesied and illustrated in Scripture. Because we can tell you something. It wasn't easy to qualify you to get you into Jehovah's house. It wasn't easy. Because it's a holy place. And in order to enter into this holy place where God dwells in person, not in spirit, it meant a great upgrading of you would have to take place. After all, you don't just have anybody walking into God's house. It's a holy place. And in order to ready you for it, 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 it took significant work. It wasn't a simple or easy thing. And that's why you should appreciate it all the more. Now, let's just speak about one prophecy that illustrated it. This was back at the time when Zechariah was trying to stir them all up to get Jehovah's literal house rebuilt. And at that time, he pointed forward to what would be happening today. Now turn to Zechariah. I mentioned that so we could turn there. We'd like to point out a few verses. But we'd like you to see significantly that this house would be a place not just for those who would be anointed, spirit begotten, and working uh, there to see that the sacrifices, spiritually speaking, were offered up to God, but he was going to... Uh, open it up and get people who would be Gentile into this place. Now, if you're in the book of Zechariah, look in chapter 2. Now, notice what it says at verse number 11. Now, following closely here, so we see how we fit in, he said prophetically, and many, now notice that word, nations, will certainly become joined to Jehovah in that day, and they will actually become my people. Now notice, and I will reside in the midst of you. Oh, that's why we said that we have been brought into Jehovah's great spiritual house where Jehovah dwells in person. So here through Zechariah, he said, I'm going to bring not just spiritual Israelite. Yes, they're going to be there and carry out the priestly duties. They're going to function in the courtyard of the priest, and they're going to function there and the spiritual aspects, the holy thing being anointed. But in addition, he said, I'm going to bring nations or people of all nations, and I'm going to bring them in. But he said, I will reside in the midst of you. That's fulfilled because in Jehovah's great spiritual house, he dwells there in person. 
And if you have been brought into this great superstructure, this great spiritual house, then it means, as what it says here, that you are in the house where Jehovah dwells in your midst. That's why we said it took a little difficulty to get you ready. Now, this same prophet hold to Zechariah because a little background will help to show how he would get nations and a great crowd of them ready for worship at his house was illustrated back there among the Philistines. And what had actually happened throughout all of Philistia, they had five principal cities, big cities, like if you said New York, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Atlanta. In other words, if you took five big cities, well, in ancient Philistia, they had five great cities, powerful, and uh, they represented quite a lot. And they weren't serving God. They were, in fact, quite arrogant. And so Jehovah decided to punish them. And you know what he did? Four of them he wiped out over a period of time. Now, this impacted the Philistines because here, their five-league city, and they were haters of Jehovah's people, he suddenly, over this period of time, that is, wiped out four of their cities, Ashkelon, Ekron, Gath, and Gaza, wiped out. And in fact, the only Philistine city left was Ashdod. And Zechariah showed that Jehovah was going to do something very special with that population. Now, let's see exactly what it was. Go to chapter 9. Now, with that background in mind, you can focus on what was going to happen there. And then we will see how it affects all of us today. Now, in Zechariah 9, let's go right to verse 6. Now, notice what he says prophetically. He says, and an illegitimate son will actually seat himself in Ashdod. And I shall certainly cut off the pride of the Philistine, and I will remove his bloodstained things from his mouth and his disgusting things from between his teeth. And he himself also will certainly be left remaining for our God. And he must become like a sheik in Judah, and Ekron like the Jebusite. And I will encamp as an outpost for my house so that there will be no one passing through and no one returning and there will be no more pass through them a taskmaster. For now I have seen it with my eyes. Did you notice that? In verse 6, or did you overlook what was going to happen to that final and fifth city Ashdod, that Philistine city, it said an illegitimate son. In other words, the natives, the original population who inhabited and lived there, uh, were going to undergo a change. And so Jehovah said, uh, I'll certainly cut off the pride of the Philistines, those whirlings. Well, when he destroyed their four principal cities, that, that brought them down. And when they were just down to one, Ashdod, they were ready to be humble. And he showed the people there are going to change. How? Look at verse 7. Did you know that? He said, I'm going to remove his blood-stained things from his mouth. I'm going to remove the disgusting things from his teeth. And then what was going to happen? He says, He's going to be left remaining for our God. He's going to come over. That population is going to change. They're not going to stay arrogant and hateful. They're going to be humbled by this. They're going to make this transformation and change so that when I clean them up, and they were dirty compared to God's law. They were filthy. They offered unacceptable sacrifices to their heathen and pagan gods. They would uh, eat blood. They wouldn't drain the blood from animals. So he said all that disgusting, unclean things as far as worship 
was concerned. He said, I'm going to remove all that from them. And when I humble them and break them down, then they're going to now change, undergo a transformation. Now they're going to be ready to do a little work at God's house. They're going to be ready to take up something. In fact, at the end of verse 7, I wanted you to notice that. He said, they're going to become like a sheep in Judah. That's somebody important. A sheik, that's not a nobody. A sheik is the head of a clan. That's number one. He's not number two or five or ten. The sheik is the main one. So he's showing this transformed Philistine was going to be upgraded, cleaned up, and he was going to be given serious and significant and distinguished responsibilities at Jehovah's house. In fact, such responsibilities and such an elevation, he said, from being a nobody and carrying out filthy and unclean worship, he was going to be upgraded and become like a sheik. Head of a clan, number one, not number two or five or dragging along somewhere. At the end. He just didn't work in Jehovah's house that way. And that's exactly what happened. Now, let me ask you this. We gave that background not just to tell a story. Who do you think those transformed Philistines represent in our day and time? Who do you think they represented that had to be cleaned up and changed and brought up to standards if they were going to be uh, brought and given some distinguished sheik-like service at Jehovah's house. Who do you think the transformed Philistines represented today? Uh, Sister uh, Dorothy Brown, speak for them, please. That would be all of us, the anointed, as well as a great crowd of people today. The great crowd leave the anointed. See, he said, remember, like a sheik in Judah. So the anointed were true Judeans. And you see, they were carrying out the service for God. But the, the outstanding thing here was that he was going to take hateful, prideful Philistines who were disgusting in their worship. Unclean animals they would offer up to pagan heathen gods, not even drain the blood. So he'd liken that to disgusting filth all between their teeth, eating these. And he was going to clean all that up and change them, transform them, bring them into his house, give them a distinguished place of worship, upgrade them and say, now you are not, you are not a Judean. But you're going to have to act like one when it comes to worship. You... Are that transformed Philistine. Now, remember we said it was hard to get you ready to come into God's house? Now, I don't want to discourage you, but you think what you were like before you got the truth. Some not so bad as others, but some of you were smoking cigarettes and using drugs, committing immorality. Some of you have taken blood transfusion. Somebody might have even murdered somebody. See, that's all that disgusting and filthy thing. See, that was in the world. That was with that arrogance of the ancient Philistine. But when Jehovah wiped out four of their key cities and got right down to the one remaining one and then pressed in on them, he said, there will be some changes because this remnant of the ancient Philistine wants to change. And when Jehovah cleaned him up, then he said, now you can come into my house. Or do some service in connection with it. You can take up temple activity. But you've got to accept the responsibility of it. You've got to see where you came from. What took on Jehovah's part to get you to where you are. And then when given these responsibilities. You've got to carry them out as though you understand their distinguished privileges. And you must act like the head of a clan. Not the second one or in the middle or dragging along on the tail end. You would have to appreciate 
your responsibilities at Jehovah's Great House. Now, we said, brothers, in introducing it, it took a lot of effort on Jehovah to get you ready to come into this house. And I'm sure you couldn't tell what he saw worthy in you to bring you into this holy place where he dwells in person, his own house. Now think about it. There's only just over four million living now who Jehovah has brought in his house. We've got over five billion people alive. But for some reason, he saw something in you. And by that I mean when you were still out in the world, perhaps with disgusting things between your teeth and violating God's law because of ignorance he saw something in your heart that moved him to send someone to you to cut off the pride that was in you to upgrade you and then he could bring you into the house where he dwells in person not merely in spirit that should really move us with appreciation. So really the question now, since we find ourselves in this great house, is have I accepted my responsibilities in Jehovah's great house? And am I showing appreciation that he's brought me here. He could have skipped me and got someone like me, but if he did, that wouldn't help me. Well, let's see what our responsibilities are next. Since you're in this privileged place, turn now to what John saw in Revelation. And let's see what he says. He points out here two basic responsibilities on the part of this transformed Philistine this one who had been cleaned up to act in a distinguished, responsible way, like a sheik. Now, let's see what our responsibilities are. Then we can examine and measure ourselves. It's in chapter 7. You probably knew to turn there. Now, John glimpsed the same thing. Look at verse 9, first of all. Follow carefully. He says, After these things I saw and looked, a great crowd which no man was able to number. Out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, notice this now, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes, and there were palm branches in their hands. So now you, we see clear why John could envision, see this great crowd standing before the throne, because in the heavenly realm of this great spiritual house, uh, Jehovah's enthroned in his palace. So he sees this great crowd, but now the responsibility there, the first one, it says they were dressed in white robes. Now that's the first responsibility then, and we'll talk about it in a moment, to maintain the purity of that white robe worship. Now, let's get the second aspect of our responsibility at this great house. Now, go down to verse 15, and it says, That is why they are before the throne of God, and they are rendering him sacred service day and night nearby his temple. And the one seated on the throne will spread his tent over them. Did I get that right? See, some follow scriptures care. Straighten it out then. Brother Munjan, straighten that out. That was important. In his temple. So what is the significance of that? In his temple. Brother Munjan, you want to continue? Brother Thompson. That means we are in his house. Yes, very good. That's, the, that's what we've talked about all evening, wasn't it? So the second responsibility, he said he saw this great crowd. Now notice they were worshiping, and he said they were rendering sacred service. 
Now, they were not off in some little corner where God just had a casual interest in them. That's what is pointed out. No, God had elevated them, brought them up to this distinguished place, and he brought them in his temple, in its earthly part. Not some place divorced of him and his personal attention or in a little part where he didn't directly come in contact with, but he had cleaned them up and brought them in and so they could render sacred service day and night in his temple. Now, those are the two basic responsibilities for those of the great crowd in Jehovah's great spiritual house. The one we read, they had to maintain the white robes and they had to render sacred service. Now, let's just elaborate on those two basic responsibilities. Let's start with the last one we read there, sacred service. Now, this is going to connect. If you listened carefully earlier, and I'm sure you did, this is going to connect up so nicely for you because we've had a number of studies on this, but the Watchtower has helped us back first in 1980. We had a questions from readers, and it clearly showed us what sacred service was. Prior to that, it was a little bit hazy. We thought you could do anything to bring God glory and praise him, and it was sacred service. Then... Back in 1980, we underwent a study that got deep into the Greek word latrevia that's translated sacred service. And here's what it said. Follow closely. It said that sacred service refers to dedicated worship or service to God. It involves giving one's primary allegiance to Jehovah. This has to do specifically with service to God done out of appreciation for sacred things, something out of the ordinary that calls for sacrifice of time and energy. Or, simply put, it is direct service to God and worship. Now, it's not just living a good, clean life and taking care of your family and keeping your house clean and looking after your children and being kind to your neighbors and being honest on the job. All of that's fine. You have to do it. But you see, that doesn't involve direct service to God. Now, remember we talked earlier and we were endeavoring to emphasize it then that when those non-priestly Israelites could go to the temple and they just yearned to be there and pined away. And they could only have one week, two times a year. And they wanted that. And why did we say they wanted to be there? Because even though they served Jehovah back where they live, when they went to that temple, they were involved in direct service to God. So they were sad when they'd have to leave it and Go back home. They were still serving God and doing things. But there was nothing like being involved. Hands-on worship. Sacred service. Direct service to God. Oh, but did you notice about the great crowd rendering sacred service day and night in this temple? So the privilege would be expanded when this great crowd came in and wouldn't have to just be limited to one chance for a week, two times a year. But that they'd be able to work in their whole life, this sacred service. So what it means for us then is, do we support fully the things that involve direct service to God? In his temple, day and night. Uh, for example, now, we'll take examples. When you preach formally or informally, you're in sacred service. If you meet with the group or go out and you go house to house, you go on the corner, you go do your Bible study, all of that is sacred service. Now, if you are on your job, and you buy out the time and you witness to someone uh, 10 minutes, then that becomes sacred service. The rest of the time isn't. See, it is just when you get in direct service to God. But it isn't just limited to 
uh, preaching, meetings. When you attend your meetings each week, each meeting brings you into sacred service. This is worship. That's why it's so commendable. And I like to commend you, friends. You came this evening. Six o'clock Saturday. That's prime time in the world. Some of the favorite shows are on TV right now. Some of the best shopping around for bargains. But you chose to participate in sacred service, direct service to God. We commend you for it. And as you do that each week, support all your meaning. That, that's sacred service. Now, in addition, when we say uh, after the meeting, so-and-so group will clean the kingdom hall, that's sacred service. Why? Because we built this and dedicated to God. This is just for sacred service. We don't run any daycare or barbecue here and sell dinners. <laughs> this is all for sacred service to Jehovah God. Now, when you go home and clean your house, I don't know its condition, maybe it needs it. But when you go home and clean it, you have to do it. It brings honor to God, but it is not sacred service. But if you respond to the announcement that says, Brother So-and-So's group will clean the hall this evening, then you should see everyone in that group. Oh, I, I have an extension of the sacred service this evening. You're getting credit with God. Remember, that's showing appreciation. Jehovah's blessed us to have a congregation, to have a hall. I'm surprised that some who will walk out and not leave it in a one condition. But we know some do. But is that really appreciation? For what Jehovah's done to get you in here. And that is sacred service. Cleaning your own house is not sacred service. I don't care if it's spotless. But when you participate here at sacred service, likewise, as we reviewed earlier, when it was built, it was sacred service. When you saw the sisters bring food here to feed the worker, when you cooked that food at home and brought it here, that was sacred service. Now, when you went back and fixed it for your family, that was not sacred service. Now, admittedly, they have to eat, and I'm sure they appreciated it. But you see, sacred service is when you are involved in direct service to God. Worship. In his temple. Sacred service doesn't have to do with every single thing. Likewise, all the other duties. Are you a servant? Or an elder? Those are special services. That's sacred service. Every duty, every duty you're assigned as an elder, as you carry it out, it's sacred service. Every duty you are assigned as a ministerial servant is sacred service. That's why we rejoice if you're the attendant. And you come here early and open it up and check the ventilation and open the parking lot. So that when the friends arrive, it's done. Now, we feel good. And we say, there's someone acting responsibly. He's taken his duties like a sheik, head of a clan. But now you come here and it's locked up. You go in here, it's cold and things over the floor disarray. Somebody is lacking in appreciation. Somebody doesn't realize that they're in the house where God is in person. Somebody does not really realize what it took to qualify and get them up to this level and that they are given privileges and responsibilities in connection with sacred service. If you're the brother to take care of our accounts and money, that's sacred service. Taking care of your own money is not sacred service. If you're assigned to look after the magazines and the books, how wonderful it is when you go back there at the counters and you see the brothers there. And when you see them early, because a lot of the friends come early, they want to get their magazines, they want to get their books early. They plan to come here. How discouraging it is. If you have a servant assigned, that privilege and it's sacred service, and you come and it's locked up. He's not there. See, everything... You do that involves direct service to God, 
constitutes sacred service. If you're a pioneer, all your pioneer duty is sacred service. Your family head, when you call them together once a week and study the Bible with you, that's sacred service. One hour of it. Skip it and everybody watch TV. You missed it. That's not sacred service. You need rest, skip it. It's not sacred service. You get credit with God when you put them in direct service to him. When you study and prepare your own lesson so you can come to the book study and you've taken the time to uh, absorb what is in the Revelation Climax book so you can make comments, that's sacred service. When you raise your hand and make a comment, you're participating in sacred service. Now, we go on and on and on. We've got the point. He saw that great crowd rendering sacred service day and night in his temple. And we should show appreciation for the privilege of sacred service. Absorb yourself fully in the features of sacred service at God's house. Now, let's go to the other aspect of our responsibility. Someone remind us what it was Covered sacred service. What did it say earlier, Brother Myers? That this great crowd was dressed in white robes. Yes. Now let me just make a comment. How your robe got to be white. And I think we figured it out already. You know where you came from. You were that Philistine with disgusting things in the mouth and between the teeth. In other words, when they did not drain sacrifices they made and when they took unclean animals of birds and sacrificed them to false gods all of that was filthy worship so what Jehovah did in bringing us out of that transforming us as a Philistine he then showed us what our wrongs were cut off our pride had someone teach us to build up our faith. Then we started exercising faith. And then we got to the point where we made a dedication of our life to God. And we were baptized in water. Then you took up residency in Jehovah's great house. Now, just as we go along, and this is important. You're not dedicated. You're not baptized. Sorry, you're not in this great house. You can't. It is your dedication that counts. Now, those of you who are progressing toward dedication and baptism, fine, you're on the way. But for those who know about it and put it off, then you lack appreciation and your life is in danger because, remember, we pointed out earlier in connection with Ezekiel's visionary temple that that represented that this great spiritual house would stand after the great tribulation. And those who are in it will stand with it. Those who have not made a dedication and got baptized, they will not be in it. Because you don't have on a clean robe. If you're holding back willfully from baptism, it's because you can't put the clean robe on. There's something unclean in your life. Now, that's true if you are uh, a tender a teenager, a younger one. Some of you have been in this uh, truth every minute of your life. Why shouldn't you make a dedication and get baptized? You know all the dirt, what happens at school and in the neighborhood. And you know what's clean, what Jehovah's people will do. Now, if you decide, I want to hold back from getting that white robe of clean standing, then Jehovah will hold you responsible. So the white robe then represents a clean standing before God. It means that you will not allow the uncleanness of the world to spot you up in any way. In other words, it means that you are going to maintain the cleanness of that robe. If not, out of the house you're going. And we were sad in this past service year. We had to disfellowship 44,687. That's in one year. Put out of the house because they did not maintain the cleanness and purity of that white robe. They went back to fornication, adultery, or immorality, or smoking cigarettes, or taking blood transfusions, or whatever. In other words, they did backward steps and reverse the transformation that Jehovah had brought on them, and so they had to be rejected and put out of God's house. So it is required... 
uncleanness. And that white robe then is to symbolize continued purity on the part of the one wearing it. Now, let's take it another step. And we deliberately mentioned the rejection of over 44,000 through disfellowshippings last year put out. But that just deals with the basics. When we say cleanness, we're not primarily talking about going out and getting involved in some gross or serious sin of immorality and having to be disfellowshipped. No, the, the standard's higher. Uh, from the point of view of the Bible, when Jehovah talked with Israel about cleanness in the past and uncleanness, uncleanness meant any indecent or impure kind of behavior. So it means in that white robe, we have to see that no spot gets on it, that nothing soils it, that it stays clean. Now, we're in this world, but not a part of it. But everywhere we go, there's effort on the part of whirlings, those who remain Philistines, to spot or dirty up that robe. If we allow that, then we're jeopardizing our standing. So just because you're in his temple and just because you're rendering sacred service direct service to God it doesn't automatically mean that that white robe is without a spot you could have some soil or spots on it and just because Jehovah hasn't rejected you and put you out doesn't mean well he will allow it remember this is the house where God dwells in person And he does not allow filth, dirt, or uncleanness of any kind. And he's elevating us progressively, gradually, little by little, so that uh, one day we qualify to maintain that place forever. But when he counsels us and gives direction and shows what can spot up or make unclean that robe, then we ought to change. Now, let's just ask a few questions to think about things that could make us with a spot on that robe or unclean that might not get us thrown out right away, but places our standing of purity at risk. Are you an unmarried Christian that is single? Are you involved in any unclean sexual conduct? I don't mean fornication or adultery or you got to come to a committee. But you see, there's a lot of space in there to do unclean things that would involve sexual activity before you get to gross immorality. And sometimes among those single, they do that. They feel there's someone that they like very much romantically and They like to start with certain intimacies that really belongs to people who are married. That's an uncleanness. That spots the road. You may not have gone as far as intercourse, but your standing is at risk. It is all before Jehovah's eyes. It is his house where he dwells in person not merely in spirit. Well, now, are you married? Same thing. Are you involved in any unclean sexual activity with someone other than your mate? Even something uh, like flirting with someone in the neighborhood and exchanging flirts or getting overly familiar and people like to put their hands on some of the opposite sex, pat them, it goes on at work. You see it. Some people accept it. Some even exchange kisses or embraces. I mean, the romantic type. Yes, it is not categorized as adultery. But what about your white robe that was cleaned up through dedication? It can soil it, put a spot on it, and place at risk your standing. What about your speech? If you put aside obscene jesting, if you put aside all profanity, is what comes out of your mouth clean? 
when you get under stress, do you reach back and get some of those words you used to know when, before you were transformed? See, some people like that. They get upset and angry enough, then they resurrect that old vocabulary. Before they know it, he is coming out of the mouth. Oh, they say a little this or that. that it's not going to get me disfellowshipped. Well, what about your white robe? Is it obscenity? Then it's not clean. Is the jesting or joking vulgar and obscene? Then it spots or soils. We're in God's house. Purity of behavior is required. More and more we see it coming to the surface in this day and time. You can go almost anywhere, and when they have the radio on, the same few stations, or what they're playing, they're just blaring it out, and here come the obscenities and the filth of ideas. And even if it's not the words always, the concept can be filthy. I read a quote. in the magazine that said regarding rap music it said it has conquered the culture so has it conquered you why would someone who's a Christian be attracted to something that was nasty naughty by nature see it's that, that just pump that stuff in your mind I'm just working out in the field trying to keep my mind on the Lord and, Every door it seen had the same scene. Boom, da, boom, boom. I mean, I'm I'm home later trying to get my mind on the Bible. It's racing through my mind. Yeah, you know me. <laughs> you, you see, I mean, it just comes at you all around, even when you try your best. It's coming at you. Now, what about the person that purchases it and go watch it and really gets deeply into the thing? an uncleanness then, isn't it? Have you disposed of all physical appendages of Babylon the Great in your home? Sometimes people who study, they don't recognize that the prophets who uh, condemned the wrong worship breaking out in ancient Israel referred to these appendages of Babylonish worship as dungy idols such as the Jeremiah 50 and verse 2, dungy idols. And uh, there, the dungy idol literally meant uh, dung pellets. And that's what was mixed in with false religious worship. So if you come to Jehovah's clean house, you should get rid of all of the appendages of filthy, dungy, Babylonish worship. All idolatry, that includes all religious pictures, all religious music. Now, maybe you were the kind before you got the truth that used to uh, like to turn on and get your hymns playing in the house. Some of them, that's how they get a religious feeling. They turn on and listen to these hymns. And they like to really rock a little bit with it. That's how they get their religion. No. Those are appendages of Babylon the Great. False religious pictures. Babylonish hymn. And then even if you have taken, uh, you see some like to buy posters or pictures of their favorite hero in the sports world or in Hollywood. Someone they like to look at. Maybe someone jumping up and doing a dunk or they hang it on their wall. That's my man. They can put it in. Or they get someone good looking out in Hollywood. Got my smile on. They will get his poster. Don't run me $15. I can put it all over the wall. I'm sorry. That's what you got. Dung pellets hanging on your wall. <laughs> That's how the Bible describes all of that idolizing of anything in Satan is false worship. That's what was done by the Philistine before they were transformed and made for our God. 
What films do you watch? Are you still uh, liberal watching R-rated films and being tentilated by sensuality and sexuality? Do you rent those videos? Do you buy them? Does it not bother you to see people fornicating on the screen? That's acting today. Acting today is taking your clothes off and simulating sexual scenes. Almost every film is laced with this. And so the world will say, well, it's kind of bad. We restrict it, rated R. Uh, some people have them in their home. And they watch them. They rent them. And it doesn't bother. Think about your role. Think about where Jehovah has brought you. Think about... You're in his house before him in this clean, lovely place of worship. Do you watch violent spectator sports such as boxing or wrestling? The direct violence, the viciousness of it, the aim to hurt, to knock out. It's all unclean activity. And what about a young person at school? There are many unclean activities there at school. Do you participate in the birthday parties? Do you eat a piece of the cake later on? Do you go to the pep rallies and get it really going with the rest? And pumped up and yelling and screaming, my team, my hero. My. You see, all such is unclean activity. They're idolizing heroes, idolizing the team, idolizing the school. All of that constitutes False worship, it is not clean worship, it does not constitute sacred service, it soils or makes dirty that white robe that we're to stand before Jehovah on. Well, we could go on and on the list, but I think we have clear in mind the point that Jehovah makes, that he's brought us to this lovely, clean place of worship. He's allowed us to come into these grand courtyards of his great spiritual house, his great spiritual temple, and worship him. We think about back in ancient Israel, and there's a severe warning to us. The penalty for mingling uncleanness with Jehovah's pure worship and temple activity was death. Uh, look there in Leviticus 15. This sort of really sums up and it helps us to see how, what it really means for us to be separate from the world. Leviticus 15. Now look down at verse 31. And as we see how Jehovah explained it to them, then it is helpful to us. Leviticus 15. Now look at verse 31. And how that law was stated. And you must keep the sons of Israel. Now notice. Separate from their uncleanness, that they may not die in their uncleanness for their, now notice, defiling of my tabernacle, which is in their midst. So, in other words, even when they were back there in the wilderness with temple activity around the tabernacle, he said you must keep them separate from their uncleanness. In other words, any time you participated in temple activity, temple worship, service at the tabernacle, anything that involved that service to God, you could not have defiled yourself with any uncleanness because Jehovah said it defiled the tabernacle. So he said separate. If they get unclean, that's why they had these purification things they had to go through to get clean again so that they couldn't defile Jehovah's tabernacle or bring uncleanness into his house. So he showed separateness of the individual worshiper must be maintained from his uncleanness. Otherwise it defiled, he said, the tabernacle which is in their midst. Likewise today. If we allow that white robe to be spotted, soil with uncleanness from the world, we don't apply that and keep it clean as it was when we dedicated our life and got baptized, you see our uncleanness is with us. And then we try to override that by getting in Jehovah's direct service, going in the field, coming to meetings. and all. It does not override it. He says it defiles his temple. It defiles his house. He said, you must let them see, but they must be separate from their uncleanness. So today in Jehovah's great spiritual house, we're to maintain cleanness, a white robe. Clean physically, clean mentally, clean morally, clean emotionally, 
clean spiritually and in every way if we are to have the privilege to serve in his temple day and night. Those are our basic responsibilities in Jehovah's great house. To render him sacred service day and night and to maintain the purity of our white robe clean standing before him. And those who appreciate their privileges at this house will do their best to carry out their responsibilities. We can sum it up with what the psalmist continues to say. Go back to Psalm 84. It would be very fine to just let his thoughts and appreciation for his privileges and responsibility motivate us with this grand privilege that we have today. Psalm 84 Now go to verse number 10. And he says, for a day in your courtyards is better than a thousand elsewhere. I have chosen to stand at the threshold in the house of my God rather than to move around in the tents of wickedness. What appreciation. He said very clearly, I love the courtyards of your great house And likewise, today, when we're in the courtyards of Jehovah's great house in this earthly realm, we feel as he did, I'd rather be there than anywhere else. He said, I'd rather be there one day just standing with a little old menial responsibility. I'd rather if I just had to stand in that one place and just welcome and do that all day. That's such a privilege because that is direct service to God. I would have more joy out of doing that one day than to let me go through all the filthy, unclean tents of wickedness doing whatever I wanted to please the flesh. What appreciation. And those who have such appreciation, look how he will bless them. Verse number 11, it says, For Jehovah is a sun and a shield. Favor and glory are what he gives. Jehovah himself will not hold back anything good from those walking in faultlessness. What a blessing for maintaining that place. He says favor and glory are what he gives. He says he will not hold back anything good from those in his house that are walking in reality a faultless and upright way. So we have that great privilege today. And how grand it is to be a part of this great superstructure. The only structure that is going to remain when this system goes down into destruction at the great tribulation. And how glad we will be at that time that we're maintaining our place, standing in God's temple, carrying out that sacred service in a clean, pure, white robe, day and night, just as Jehovah said, so that he can usher us into that clean, new world, intact, in this earthly part of his great spiritual house. So let all of us continue to show the utmost appreciation for all of our responsibilities at Jehovah's Great House.